are officially recording. And thank you guys for coming. Um, I'd like to int introduce to you um, Greg Phillips. He is the director of aviation at the Colorado Springs Airport. Um, he's an instrument rated commercial pilot, holds an engineering degree from West Point, and earned his wings as a helicopter pilot and army ranger. Following his military service as an officer in the army, he worked as an engineering project manager for Boeing and as a civil engineer and program manager for the Federal Aviation Administration. While at the FAA, he also served as deputy program manager during the design and construction of the Denver International Airport, and then has also served in executive positions at five airports, beginning at Bend Municipal, Municipal Airport in Oregon, the Oregon Airport Manager of the Year, and then served as deputy, deputy director at Missoula, Montana International Airport, Airport Director in Wenatchee, oh good, I was almost, almost there, <laughs> Wenatchee, Washington, <laughs> and then the Vail Eagle County Regional Airport Executive Director before assuming his current role here in Colorado Springs. Um, he is currently the President of the Northwest Chapter Board of Directors for the American Association of Airport Executives and as a member of both the Colorado Springs CVB Board and the Economic Development Council. He is an accredited airport executive, a senior fellow of the Council for Excellence in Government, and an active member of the Colorado Airport Operators Association. Outside of work, he's an avid cyclist and a longtime alpine ski race coach. So this is our um, North Campus, or most of it. On this slide, we have four out of our five, um, <coughs> excuse me, four out of our five admissions. And then Andy and, or I guess six now, and then Andy and Taylor are also part of the missions. And then Alexia is one of our <laughs> directors of student success. And we have Tracy who should be joining us shortly as well. All right. So, and then it looks like we have three or four joining us from the South Campus too. Great. All right. Well, let's get started then. <clears throat> So by that uh, long bio, you know, you only get a bio like that if you're old, I guess. So, uh, <laughs> you've done a lot of jobs there. So um, welcome. I'm tickled to have the chance to come visit with you and talk about aviation and airports as a career option. I know that you have an aviation management program, and um, I'm here to tell you there's a whole lot more to aviation than just being a pilot or being a mechanic and working on aircraft. So uh, I thought what we'd do today is I'm gonna talk about the airport. And we'll talk about the airport structure and environment and then some of the jobs that are available in that realm here. But it, it, as I do, and as you read the bio there um, and, and hear it recited, uh, let me just kind of encapsulate a few things and kind of what brings me to where I am, the, the skill set basically. So first off, I had an engineering degree. As you heard, I went to West Point, engineering degree. Um, I did a lot of project management, so I have a project management background. I was a pilot, so understanding the aviation realm. Um, and then also um, had a period of time where I ran a business doing training and organizational development and leadership coaching. So working with people, uh, project management skills, um, understanding engineering and construction, and then uh, the ability to work in the aviation environment. So those are the skill sets that I like to think I bring to the, the work that we do. And um, let's talk about the airport. So Colorado Springs Airport here. So let me give it back to me. There we go. All right. Whoa. So here we are. So first off, the airport is a city of, so it is part of the, color, the city of Colorado Springs, but it's what we call a public civil military airport. And why is it civil military? Well, it's because if you can see on the screen there, all the development at the bottom of the screen is actually to the north. You'd be looking toward me is to the north, and that's Peterson Air Force Base. So Peterson Air Force Base is actually on the airport property. So it's not actually a separate, a separate federal or military facility. It's actually leased property that belongs to the city. So 
um, so that's Peterson Air Force Base, <clears throat> because they have operations there. That's what makes us a civil military airport. Colorado Springs Airport is the second largest airport in the state. Um, I bet you can name the one that's larger. So, <laughs> like Harry Potter, we call it the airport that shall not be named. Uh, okay. no, I'm, I'm kidding. So we have a great relationship with folks at Denver, um, and I like to think that, that Colorado Springs is very complementary to what Denver offers. We're a little different product, and I'll talk about that. So, what's that? You're user friendly. We are user friendly, <laughs> by golly, that's a, that's a big part of the difference, no doubt. So, um, and the, we have a number of tenants on the airport, and they lease from us, but the largest tenant, of course, is Peterson there. Um, and you can see from our budget, the $17 million annual budget, that's up or down from year to year. But I, I'm always pleased to say that we run into black. And here's what's cool about airport, is an airport operates in what the city calls an enterprise fund. And what that means is that we operate on our own, that our budget is entirely separate from the rest of the city budget, and that we don't take any general tax dollars. So some of you may have heard this phrase that, by golly, government should run more like a business. And that's exactly what airports do. And that's one of the things that I think is so fun about this operation, about what we do, is that we really run like a business, which means we're concerned with our revenues, we're concerned with how we make money, we're concerned with how much we're spending, and we pay very close attention to that. So while we have a $17 million annual budget in revenues, our actual expenses for this year are about $14.5 million. So we put that money into our bank that we can then put back into the development for the airport. So if running a business appeals to you, then don't rule out government because at an airport, that's what we do. And that's, to me, one of the things that makes it fun is running it like a business. Thinking about what else can we do to bring revenues into the airport? What other opportunities do we have that maybe we're not exploring or we've not been able to realize fully? But how do we do that? So traffic, when we think about the airport and how it operates, of course, everybody thinks first about the commercial service. And the commercial service is a big part of what we do. And as you can see here from this, this slide, we have about 1.3 million passengers, that's what tax is, traveling through the airport, either arriving or departing in 2016. And we see that number going up pretty significantly in 2017. So um, we're up 30% on the year so far. Why wow. such a big increase this year? Well, last year? well, let me talk about that. A lot of it has to do with new routes that brought by Palantir. That's what I was saying. Okay. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. And so, But we've also had seen success with our other air carriers as well. And so as they grow and as Frontier grows, the, the utilization of the airport goes up and we've seen tremendous growth. In fact, if we finish at 30%, it will be the largest percentage growth of the top 150 airports for this year. So it's pretty significant. And then the other thing we track pretty closely are aircraft operations. And that happens through the control tower. And the control tower is staffed by Federal Aviation Administration staff, um, airport tra air traffic controllers. And um, they keep track of that. They manage and control all the aircraft in the vicinity of the airport. And um, they are the great partners with us and a key part of it, obviously, for keeping the airport and the environs around the airport safe. So, structure how are we set up so that airport itself has 97 positions right now? And it changes a little from year to year, but that's pretty pretty close to where we intend to keep it. Um, and our goal is only add positions that add value. We don't add positions, just to add positions. So, but you can see here how we're, how we're broken down sort of in the main level. And I, I show this because I think it shows between this and the next couple of slides, different kind of jobs just at the airport itself. So there as the, the director and in my position, I report directly to the mayor. So the mayor's my boss. Um, and then I work with the city council 
<clears throat> and I also have a board of directors that, that we call the Airport Advisory Commission that, that I work with. So everybody has a boss. <laughs> a, so I have somebody who works with me who's a corporate outreach specialist, and she helps sort of manage like my schedule and also she does outreach to a lot of the different organizations that we deal with. You heard in my bio that I sit on the Convention of the Visitor Bureau Board, also on the Economic Development Council. And so, you know, scheduling all those things and reaching out to those people to help set things up is a big part of what she does. We also um, have, we have two key people here and then the Assistant Director for Operations and Maintenance, responsible largely for running the airfield on a day-to-day -day basis and the Assistant Director for Finance and Administration. And so Finance and Administration is focused on business development, largely, and management of leases, contracts, that sort of thing. And then the other piece that is separate, that reports directly to me, is a marketing and communications manager. As you if, you, if you read the papers or listen to the news, you see that the airport is in the news pretty often. People are interested in aviation. And, and it's kind of interesting that way, and to me, that's one of the things that makes it funny, because everybody cares about aviation. Everybody wants to know about aviation. It may not always be happy, but everybody cares <laughs> about aviation, and you see that. So can, can any of you tell me when the last commercial aircraft accident, fatal accident, was in this country? Anybody know? Just like no outside sources, just malfunctions of the... Just, just uh, yeah, in, in the United States, domestic United States, aircraft fatal accident. Commercial. Commercial. Uh -huh. 2009. Wow. So last year, more than 800 million people flew. 800 million people flew. And the last time we had a fatal accident in the United States was the Colvin Air incident in Buffalo, New York in February of 2009. And I bet you, if you all search memory banks a little bit, you heard of that. So here's what we're saying is that, that when 50 people died, I mean, it's a, that's a full bus load, right? right? I mean, it's, and, and it's an incredible tragedy. But you hear about it because people hear about aviation. But make no mistake, if you think about that, 800 million people traveling every year, they're not. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely the safest mode of commercial transportation. Much safer than driving. Yes. Safer than driving. Yeah. That's, that's for darn sure. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, if we think about the airport and what we do, and you look at those two positions for operations and maintenance and for finance administration, I break it down this way. We run a facility that runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Airports don't shut down. If they do, it's because of something, a uh, tragedy. So airports just don't shut down. And so we have to run that kind of facility and keep it safe, keep it running efficiently every single day. And so that's what that first position does. We also have to think about how do we make the facility better? How do we provide better services? How do we take advantage of new technologies like drones, unassisted aerial vehicles, how do we take advantage of new technologies on the ground side, like Uber, TNCs, there's Turo, if you've heard of them, that's our rental car app. So um, all these things are things that we want to grab onto. We're a very technological business, so paying attention to that. Um, perhaps you've heard of uh, low-level Bluetooth uh, for advertising. So we look at that. How do we make it so when you walk by and display that something pops up on your phone maybe that tells you hey you know if you're looking for this go here so there's so many neat cool things that we get to take advantage of and participate in at an airport and so that's what that other part does director of finance administration is focus on that and business deals so a key part of that in this day and age is marketing because as we've seen we've added 11 new flights this year, most of them with Frontier Airlines. And still, there are people like me in this community, even though it's been on every TV station, every radio station, been in the newspaper multiple times, 
people say, gosh, I wish you had a flight to San Diego. Mm -hmm. We do. <laughs> so it, getting the word out, getting the word out is key. Really important part of what we do. And so marketing is a huge part. Um, and obviously, if you look at those, you can see we have jobs for all of that. With almost 100 people at the airport, we have a wide array of positions. So let's look at this. I know this is maybe kind of small type here, but I kind of walk it through. <coughs> These are the two different slides for the two different assistant directors of aviation, ABA. So in operations and maintenance, we have a whole operations side. And these are our operations officers that are on the airfield who understand all the characteristics of the airport, how the airport runs, you know, what to be what to look for when lights are out or when something's not working to be able to, to check on that and, and get it operating again. We have badging. Obviously, security is a huge thing at the airport. So how we do badging um, for all, not just the airport employees, but everybody who does anything at the airport, we have to have to issue them a badge, which means criminal history records checks, background checks, and then issuing the badges themselves. So we have a badging section, we have the operations agents, and then we have a 24-7 dispatch facility that it operates um, and has communication specialists there and they take all the phone calls. They take any time there's an emergency, any time there's an issue, any time anything happens at the tower, they, they deal with that. Medical response, they, they manage that. So dispatch, just like a 911 dispatch would be in downtown or for El Paso County. So continuing on, you see we have facilities. So we have maintenance worker. SSMW means senior skilled maintenance worker. SMW, a skilled maintenance worker, and the maintenance worker. So uh, it's a big facility. And so as a big facility, there are things that break. And so when things break, things need to be fixed. And when even when things are working, they need to be tuned up. So this is what that staff does. Um, and they're a critical part of what we do. Um, and so we have a facility supervisor who oversees them, <clears throat> plus baggage. The, if you've ever seen how baggage moves through a terminal, it's, you know, if you remember the old game Mousetrap, you know, it's kind of like that, where it just goes left, right, up, down, and, you know, drops here and pops up there. And so it's a system that needs to be watched all the time. So, um, so we have a couple people that their job is managing that, overseeing that. Field and fleet. Now here's the fun. Everybody likes, if you remember as a kid, you know, everybody at some point in their life liked the Tonka trucks, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, we have some of the world's biggest equipment out there. So, you know, you get to continue to be a little kid in the fleet um, and field operation because <clears throat> they drive our snow plows, our, you know, powered brooms and uh, snow blowers. So, and most of this equipment is too big to be on the street, so, so it's bigger than what you see out there, you know, on, on the academy or on powers in the winter time. And um, they operate that. And for us, when it snows, that's war. So as close as we come, because our goal is never to have the airport shut down from, because we couldn't get the snow cleared. So there may be times when the airports shut down for other reasons. It could sometimes we have delays because of fog or other bad weather. But snow, that's something that we stand top of. And it's tough to do when you have a runway that's 13,501 feet long, the fifth longest commercial service runway in the country. So you know, that's our long runway at Colorado Springs Airport. Mechanics. Equipment operators, senior equipment operators, those that make up that staff. And then we have attendants that do the cleaning throughout the building, do a great job. Um, one of the things I, oh, I learned early on that I find to be true every time is people judge a facility like an airport by how clean the bathrooms are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so next time you're at Colorado Springs Airport, you go in the bathroom, you text me or email me, <laughs> the bathrooms are clean, we'll get on it. So <clears throat> it's tough to do when a facility is busy, and a lot of people are going through. 
but there are some new and interesting technologies even about how to be aware of that And then we have law enforcement. This is a you know challenging time to be in the aviation environment or any public facility and maintaining uh, law enforcement and keeping our facilities safe is really a key part. So, so under administration and finance, so as we look at running the day-to-day -day business, that was the first staff. This staff, again, is focused on how we develop and improve the facility. I tell our staff that our goal should be that at the start of every year, to be able to tell city council and be able to tell the mayor that your airport is in the best condition it's ever been. And to be able to do that every single year so that we're always focused on improving the facility. How do we make it better? How do we make sure that we're listening to our customers and that we're meeting our customers' needs? So we have under here, I can run through these kind of quickly, property administration. So that manages all the business deals and all the leases that we have. Um, so a lot of contracting and so contracting skills, important part for that position and what we do. Air service, well, air service is a big part of where our revenue come from. It's also the number one thing our community by and large is asking for. So focusing on air service, we actually have an air service manager whose whole job is nothing but looking at how do we bring in more air service? How do we improve our air service at the Colorado Springs? And that means dealing with the airlines, it means going to visit the airlines, going to conferences where the airlines are present, and continuously looking at available data so that we can make a strong business in the case that says, you know what, Charlotte would be a great route direct out of Colorado Springs, and be a great route because of these reasons, A, B, C, D, and be able to sell that then to the airlines. So, and think about it, the airlines, they don't have airplanes just sitting on the ground. They're not just waiting to be assigned somewhere. So we've got to make a pretty strong business case because if we get a route, it probably means somebody else lost a route. So we have a better business case for them than they do. So, so that's kind of how that works, and that's a key focus of what we do these days and what we're doing for the coming year. So design and construction, there's an old saying that the definite, definition of an airport is a construction site where airplanes land and take off. And it really holds true. Obviously we have construction mostly in the summer, on the outside, outdoors anyways, but we always have something that we're doing. And so the engineering, the design, the construction, the project management, all of that are key to that portion of the work we're doing. We do roughly $20 million worth of construction every year. So, IT, I mentioned that we're a technology heavy industry and you know it's important to us that we stay up with IT and not, not just on a day-to-day -day basis, that's critical, you know, because everybody uses email. Most of our staff have phones for the reason that we need to be able to contact people. We need to be able to have people in, and people work 24/7, you know, around the clock. We have different shifts, so um, just that stuff, just keeping things running and all our programs running, but also thinking about where are we going from here? So what's new? So what's new? What do we need to be on top of now? To me, this is really exciting area with everything that's happening right now. We're in the process at Colorado Springs Airport of putting together a technology master plan that will help us identify where we are and where we think we're going in the next five years. Now, IT is kind of hard to look beyond five years ago. You know, what, 10 years ago? When, when did the iPhone come out? So yeah. now, I know where we are. So um, this is a rapidly changing area. Of course, finance, nothing happens without money. But uh, we have a whole section that focuses on uh, how we invoice and pay. And so a lot of all the finance and accounting skills, our accounting manager is a CPA, our accounting supervisor is a CPA. So, you know, so these are great skills. So again, I mean, look at this. Look at the broad range of skills that we have. So if you're in the finance field, we've got a job for you. 
If you're in IT, we've got <laughs> jobs for you. If you're in construction or design or project, we have jobs for you. You know, you understand contracting, procurement, inventory, all those. We have jobs for those as well. And then the very last one here on this slide is the planner. So this is somebody with planning skills. So maybe they, you know, they got their degree and focused on, you know, aviation planning, focused on airport design. So that's a that's a really important job for us. Yeah. What do you look for when it comes to air service? So uh, air service, th this is our data key. <laughs> so he is, and I say that fondly because he's just a super at, at his job, really, really good. But he's a spreadsheet guy, you know. So here's a guy that understands details, who understands how to how, how to research data, how to analyze data, how to collate data, and put it into business plan. So I mean, it's it's fascinating stuff, um, and there's a lot of data out there that we can access um, through subscription services, and um, that's what we pulled together. So basically, so it's kind of like this. I can look at, and if we want to say, we want to route, as I used Charlotte earlier, so I use that again, route from here to Charlotte, well, the obvious candidate for that would be American Airlines, because American, you know, operates out of uh, Charlotte. So if we want to look at a flight from American to Charlotte, well, how many people from Colorado Springs <clears throat> are flying to or through Charlotte right now? Well, we can get that data because DOT, all the airlines have to turn in data like that to DOT, the uh, Department of Transportation. And so um, we can access that data and then collate it, spin it, turn it, look it up, upside down and, um, and get an idea of well, how many people are actually flying to Charlotte and does it make sense that we might have a route to Charlotte? So that's what that job does. And that person has two analysts that work for him that help uh, do all that work too. And then it's putting presentations together, getting ready to meet the airlines, putting the business case together, and then going to meet. So. I have a question for yeah. you. So on average, how often do these jobs become available? And then my second part of the question is, you were talking about anticipating you know, um, what's next? What are you going to do better? How are you going to grow? So do you anticipate a lot of job growth as well as you grow as an airport? Sure, um, a couple of good, great questions. So um, on the first, just job turnover. Yeah. So um, our turnover is, I would say we're probably in the 10 to 12% per year. So of our entire staff, there's some jobs. Like when I go back to um, the assistant director for office and maintenance, the field of fleet, those positions turn over fairly regularly. Somebody comes in, a lot of those are close to entry level positions. I'm an equipment operator. Well, if there's another opportunity to be a senior equipment operator elsewhere in the city, I might move to that, and then we hire another. So we see some turnover in that area. We see some turnover like in the dispatch and the maintenance workers. Um, this side here, uh, we see less turnover. So you know, a lot of these are more the, the white collar jobs. You know. These are a lot of these are, you know, what I call salt of the earth jobs, the, the people who work hard for us and work every day. But they are, you know, a lot of these, these positions, particularly at the, the lower lines there, those are more entry level wages. Um, and these positions pay typically higher. Okay. Aviation overall, though, and at airports, you know, is a fairly high wage scale um, career field. So, you know, many of these positions are making, you know, sixty to $90,000, somewhere around there. Um, whereas these positions here at the lower level may be making 45000 But we don't have many positions that, at the airport where people are making, you know, much less than about that. So, we're talking about it. Did you have a question? With your entry level positions, do you require um, those individuals to have degrees? No, uh, you know, no, a lot of those. So if we look here, again, sort of the, the field positions here, I, I would say the majority of these positions at the, 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 the bottom line and the middle line there do not have college degrees. Some do, okay. some do, but, uh, but a lot don't. Um, 
and then the very the sort of top line of supervisors. Some do and some don't. You know? On this one, the sort of business side, again, these are more of the white collar jobs. And so most of these positions, or, or a majority of them, do have college degrees. So those are, the, that's the organization. Let's look a little bit of it. So what is it we do? What the heck do we do? <laughs> this is why everybody here on the wall. So, so th this is why to me it's fun. So as you heard in my bio, I was a pilot. I was a military pilot. And when I got out of the military, I had this, you know, this thought, this seesawing, you know, conversation in my own head about, do I want to be a career pilot? That's something I want to do. Or is there something else I want to do? And here's what I decided. So it's just one person, but flying is fun. There's no doubt about it. I enjoy flying a lot. But flying also has a certain sameness <coughs> to it. What I do as an airport director and what our staff does at the airport is different every single day. And if there's any advice this old guy would offer to everybody watching or to students who might see this, it's that find a job where there's variety. Don't get stuck in a job where you're doing the exact same thing every single day. At least for me, that's what's made the difference. And that's what makes it. So here's what we do. Commercial air service. So that's the first part. And, and if you look at on commercial air service right now, we have five passenger airlines serving us and one cargo airline with FedEx. And our passenger traffic continues to grow right now. So you can see that we're up 10.6% in 2016. So total for the two years, 16 and 17, we'll be up more than 40% numbers continue for the rest of this year. That's great growth. And it's great growth you know, thanks to our airlines, but also thanks largely to the community who's responded to the airlines. Corporate and general aviation. So if you look at this map that's shown on the slide here, in the red, that's pretty much the air the commercial side and what we do. The blue that's on either side, that's the corporate and general aviation. That's something that if you're not in the aviation business, you don't think about that much. But these are other jobs that are out there because we have two fixed base operators, and that's those are fixed base operators like the general aviation terminal where corporate and general aviation flies in and out of. That's where they get fuel and services. The Pearson Air Force Base, which of course, as we said, is a tenant, but Peterson provides all our firefighting services. So if you look at the airport and you think about what we have, it's a little unique at Colorado Springs because we don't do our own firefighting, the military does. They have 55 fully trained firefighters at Peterson. So we are well staffed and with all the great equipment. And again, I talk about Tonka trucks and big equipment. Those fire trucks are like nothing you've ever seen because all the airport fire trucks are all wheel drive, you know, because they, they airplanes don't tend to crash just on a runway or pavement. So we've got to be able to get anywhere. So um, so these are really neat, high tech, infrared, you know, vision uh, equipped vehicles. And at most airports, the airports themselves provide the firefighting, so there are firefighter jobs that are available on airports as well. Um, and then, so you see that's the yellow, that's Peterson, and then on this map, back to this map here, we have a fourth line of business that is our business park. So this is one of the exciting things for us, is we have 900 acres that we are prepared to develop that can be non and we have, And so we have two um, for high-rise uh, business complexes there now with Northrop Grumman and with Aerospace Corporation, and they are right on that is airport property that they're on. <clears throat> and then we have all the rest that we develop. We're looking at the potential for a hotel on the airport. We're looking at the potential for a gas station, a little uh, convenience store, and, and more that we'd like to see developed there. So business development, you know, you think about a 
Oh, the airport, government, my God, plotting, <laughs> slow, bureaucratic. I don't think of it that way. I don't think of it that way at all. I think that of, of the airport is needing to be very entrepreneurial and all this business part developing them. They'll talk about business development skills there. And that's really exciting, I think. Do do all airports operate with that business framework or are some more government uh, operated? But generally, so first let's break airports into commercial and general aviation. <clears throat> so first off, there are over 19,000 landing strips of all kind in the country. Of those, there are about 5,000 that are actually public airports. And then when you take that number down, the vast majority of those are general aviation airports. And the general aviation airports, you know, many of which don't have a tower, they don't have any commercial traffic at all, um, they may not have perimeter fencing, that sort of thing. But then you get down to about the top 500, 450, 500 airports, and those are all the commercial airports. To break that down even more, the Colorado Springs for 2016 is the 101st busiest airport in the country for commercial traffic. The top 65 airports, which are the airports like, oh, SeaTac, Houston, JFK, Denver, uh, Miami, you know, those airports carry 90% of the traffic flow. Other airports may carry some of that traffic as starting, but then they flow through those big airports. So if you think about it, you know, the big airports, and that's where, to your question about turnover, well, you know, I'm talking about Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs is the 101st busiest commercial airport. You look at an airport like Denver that has thousands of employees. There are lots of jobs there. So if we think beyond just me and my parochial <laughs> interest in Colorado Springs, then if you took a look at those top 65 airports, and there are lots of great jobs, lots of great jobs. And they have, you know, other, other while, while we're similar in many ways, they'll have even more jobs in there. Their finance and accounting department may be huge. And so lots of great jobs there, et cetera. So um, if we look at what we do and the mindset and how we operate, yes, for the commercial airports, we all generally operate in the, that same mindset that we're a business and that we're here as an economic engine. The state of Colorado, the CDOT Aeronautical Fox Division, every five years commissions a study on economic impact. They found the economic impact of Colorado Springs Airport to be $1.1 billion a year to this community. So it is one of, if not, the biggest economic engines for this community. The Denver Airport is far away the biggest economic in, engine for Denver and for the state of Colorado. So, little trivia. Any idea what our number one source of revenue is? Parking. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> More than anything else. <laughs> and interestingly, parking is the number one revenue source in most airports. You know, most at the particularly the larger. Um, Denver uh, last year for 2016, the numbers I saw there, 175 million dollars in parking. Oh my gosh, that's insane. What is it like 21 months a day or something? Yeah, which is, well, it depends on where you park. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so, so continuing on, if we look at what we do, these are the things. And air, airports take a number of forms of, of ownership. And so this is a city-owned airport, Colorado Springs. The, um, Denver is city and county. Um, I have operated also at um, the Missoula Airport with an airport authority. So it's an independent airport authority, which makes it sort of quasi government <clears throat> but there are city-owned, county-owned, port-owned airports, airport authorities, and that's the majority of how airports are laid out. <clears throat> A lot of general aviation airports don't pay for themselves because they don't have the kind of traffic to be able to make enough revenue to support themselves, but commercial airports by and large do. So that's where, that's where we stand. So I'm going to skim through just a, a few more of these here. I think we've covered some of these, and I do want to leave some time 
if there are any questions. So, so here's what we have. Here's our round map right now. So you can see, you know, we had significant amount of growth, and we've got four new routes that we'll be adding next spring with Frontier. Frontier has a model where they do seasonal routes. So we're seeing that some of our routes from them are seasonal that just ended, and some of them, and we'll start again in the spring, and some like Tampa and Fort Myers that just started and will run through the winter. So book your tickets now. Are you guys going to be adding from Frontier to go anywhere in New England? I know Denver just did. So let's look at these airlines real quick here. Allegiant, American, Delta, Frontier, United. There's, I mean, we could have a whole different conversation about airlines and air traffic um, because it's really pretty fascinating. And if you look at these airlines, they all have a slightly different model that they operate under. American, Delta, and United are what we call our legacy carriers. And they are network carriers focused largely on having a complete network of routes within the United States and beyond. Um, a lot of international traffic as well. Um, and so for them, their focus is on business travelers, their focus is on you know, connecting people to their network and people who pay attention to their rewards, their miles. Frontier is a different kind of carrier. And then one that you don't see on there is sort of a sister company that's very similar, Spirit. So Frontier and Spirit are what we call ultra low cost carriers. So they're, they're point to point. They don't hub or have a national network like the legacy carriers. They focus on, as Barry Biffle, the CEO of Frontier, told me one time, selling the wow. When I open up and I look at it and I see it's a $37 one way trip to Las Vegas, I'm like, wow, I'm going. I have a reason to go, but I'm going. So, and so they've actually created the segment, the new market people who might not fly, who might just buy all the kids in the car and drive to Las Vegas mm -hmm. if they were going to go, but just not go. So now they're flying. So, but their focus has to be on keeping ticket prices low. And then there's Allegiant, and Allegiant describes themselves as not an airline company, but as a travel company that uses airplanes. They would say that to you. And so their focus is on selling packages. So if you want to book that, if you try and book a flight on Allegiant, you'll see they want to sell you a hotel, they want to get your rental car, they want to sell you tickets to the Blue Man Group. So um, for for <laughs> so for them, it's a lot about more than just the flight. So, so there are two airlines you don't see on there. There's there's Alaska, which um, sadly had only one route out of Colorado Springs, and they terminated that route in the in the fall, um, in this month in November. And um, we hope to get it back, but right now um, the issue for them is pilot shortage. Again, another topic we could take a whole nother hour on, but there is a shortage of pilots yeah. right now. So anybody who wants to be a pilot, you know, there are great opportunities for that. Uh, but And there's certainly good grounding. And even if somebody were to say, you know, I want to be in aviation management, I want to work in an airport, there's certainly something great to be said about flying for a while and had getting some experience flying. So there are opportunities now. Why do you think there is a pilot, pilot shortage right now? Well, you open the door, so I'll tell you. It's uh, three things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what I'd say, there, there are really three reasons that, that I would call to mind. Um, and the first is that uh, back in oh, what was it, 2000, I'm gonna lose, I can't think of the date, but they, they changed the retirement year for pilots from age 60 to age 65. Well, that was great. And that, for five years, kept a lot, more, a lot of pilots, senior pilots, in the system. Well, the Pipers come due now. And so a lot of those pilots are retiring now because they have to. They hit age 65. So we're seeing sort of a natural loss of pilots. The military is also struggling to get pilots, so they're trying to keep pilots in. And they're offering bigger bonuses. And that has always been a traditional manner of getting pilots into the system. So we're kind of losing that. You may have seen in the news just a few weeks ago where um, the Trump administration said that they might recall a thousand recently separated or retired pilots back into the military. Wow. 
and it, it uh, doesn't look like they're actually going to do it, but they've at least made some noise about it. Here's the other two things. I mentioned that last accident in 2009, Golden Air. So the two pilots that were flying on a regional carrier were younger, and um, they reacted improperly when the aircraft um, started having trouble, and they ended up crashing the aircraft because of it. So that really got a lot of people looking closely, and particularly the families of the people who were lost. And there were two things that were enacted you know, around and because of that. One was they changed the crew rest requirements. Well, pilots flying tired, right? Makes good sense. But if you know any pilots or any pilot friends, you know that sometimes they may live in Colorado Springs, but are based out of Newark, you know? And if they get moved, they don't move their family. They have to keep their family in Colorado Springs, school, all that. But they just have to commute then <laughs> to Newark to catch their flight to go fly. So that happens a fair amount. And what it means is sometimes people are rushing, just like you know you and I might be rushing in the morning to get to work, and um, maybe didn't get enough sleep. So now they have crew rest requirements, and they they always had them, but they increased them. And so that required more pilots. But here's the big one. They changed the flight hour requirement to be a commercial pilot from 250 hours to 1,500 hours. Wow. Now, interestingly, both pilots in the Colgan Air incidents had more than 1,500 hours. But that was a, the idea was to make sure these people were well trained. The problem is it made it that a lot more expensive for somebody to become a commercial pilot. So 250 hours you could do through your flight school almost. But now these people have to go out and yeah. get a job as a flight instructor, you know, or get a job um, towing banners or you know, flying around and dropping parachutes. So those kind of things have made it really a lot harder. And what that means is that when somebody hits 1,500 hours in a regional, they get jumped up to the majors pretty quick. So we don't see at the majors, the legacy carriers I mentioned, American Bell and United, a real loss or shortage yet, but we certainly do with the smaller carriers. Mm -hmm. um, I talked with the chief operating officer for Great Lakes Airlines. He said they went from 300 pilots to 97 pilots in a year's time. So it's something we've been watching for a few years now, and we'll continue. But at the same time, there is some hope because people are looking at alternatives to train. So there's the answer to your question. So there's a bit of a pilot shortage right now. So I'm going to charge you this. So this I only put this up here um, because this kind of refers to the fact that we're always looking at where else? Who else do we want to, who, who do we not serve right now on that list that we'd like to see flights to? So. Um, when we talk about running a business, these are the things we look at. <clears throat> you may have seen that we're offering 50% off our long-term parking for the whole month of November and December. So we talk about the cost of parking in Denver. Well, this is a whole different world parking in Colorado Springs. We offer different incentives. I won't go through them, but others say that, again, if you're thinking like a business, and you're thinking about how do we attract other businesses to the airport, then we think about the incentives that we can offer. What can we do that makes it interesting or makes it easier for businesses <laughs> to decide they want to come to the Colorado Springs Airport? Can I ask what kind of incentives you use at the chamber, for instance, like just examples or what, what incentives that we give do you give? To who, give the chamber? Yeah, sure, the chamber and the business. What incentives do you give them to fly? So the, we don't have incentives that um, incentivize people with lower ticket right. fares or anything like that. We incentivize basically by the product that we offer. Okay. So, and you know, you mentioned it, but what is the product that we sell that's different than Denver? Well, Denver, I, I like to call Denver, fondly I might add, the Walmart of airports. <laughs> they offer a little bit for everybody. You know, they offer lower prices, they have lots of selection, they've got a lot of different carriers and routes and opportunities. We all, what we offer is 
user friendly, efficient, easy to get in and out, cheaper parking. You don't have to drive an hour and a half to get up there. And best thing of all, when you get home, you're 20 minutes from home rather than having to go to your car, get your car, drive all the way down here. Who knows what the weather is? <laughs> Just a good. So that's so that's what we offer. And I also think that we can offer customer service at a little bit of larger point. So focus on customer service and take part of what makes our airport. So um, yeah. I have a question. Um, security measures. Mm -hmm. So why is it because I, I used to fly quite a bit with the company and I used to go to many different airports. Some airports make you take off your entire, you know, shoe, socks, belt, you know, and then I can walk through without even having to do that. So where why is that different? Why is it different at different airports? Yeah. Well, so TSA has been trying to standardize more, but some of it has to do with their equipment and um, even us on the airport, the airport staff, they only still only share so much in the name of security. So, um, you know, what we see is that there may be just a natural difference in how the staff is trained or how the staff supervisors may see the work that they're doing. But if you think about it, it's a pretty painless job. I always say that nobody goes through the TSA checkpoint at Sangro. Yeah. So every passenger, <laughs> every passenger of these people see all day long is already a little bit grumpy and slightly you know. So, so it's a tough job. It can be kind of thankless here, but it is an important job. It is an important job for what they do here. Um, some of it, I mean, I've been told that um, the some of the equipment, the sensitivity of the equipment, the humidity in different places makes a difference, and, that, and the sensitivity. So they. Have set their dials a little different. And I've been through checkpoint where my belt sets it off, and mm -hmm. the same belt at another checkpoint where it doesn't. But by and large, it's never something that would have been a real security issue. So some places are more. I last thing I'll tell you, I saw, I, I I like it when our TSOs, the transport security officers, say hi, hello, thank you, how are you, you know, how's your day, that kind of. Thing. Just a little bit of customer service. And at other airports, I pay attention when they don't. And I asked a guy one time, I said, I said, hi there, how are you? And he just didn't say anything. I said, I said, you I said, are you doing okay? And he says, sorry, if I had to answer every person all day long, I'd lose my voice by then. So <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so I have a question. Based on the fact that the Pearson Air Force Base is in oh, the yeah. same, yeah, exactly. You know, when you drive through the front gate, it will tell you the security level that they need to be on. Mm -hmm. So do you ever base that level of security on what the Air Force itself is working on, or Lockheed, or any of those other um, aerospace security um, businesses that are located? We, we pay attention to those things, <clears throat> and between the, our law enforcement and TSA, they pay attention to those and they, you know, notify us if there's something that uh, we, need, we need to do here. So, you know, there's no question security is a whole different world post 9-11 than it was before then and a critical feature of what we do today. When 800 million people are flying every year and we can say that successfully and Gosh, you can read things at TSA, oh, they missed a weapon, and this and that, and you know, I'm sure things like that can, can happen um, from time to time when you've got 800 million people going through every year. But the fact that we haven't had an incident in this many years does say something. Mm -hmm. It does say something. Yeah. We can argue to degree, but it does say something. They do a great job, honestly, um, and it's a tough job. So. So I don't want to forget this, but marketing. So, you know, again, we have marketing staff. And so we've been working on this and we contract with marketing companies too. This is really a lot of fun stuff we're doing. And, you know, I, uh, I have, there are a whole lot more things that I want to do with marketing. And I told my our marketing specialist the other day, I said, what I want is for people this in this community to say, what is that crazy airport going to do next? <laughs> and for us to be doing fun things and doing interesting things and 
keep in the airport in people's thinking. So, um, business. So I talk about the business and the job to do. This is an exciting time in that we're growing here as well as in our commercial service. So I won't go through these, but just to say, you know, if you haven't ever been there, the National Museum of World War II Aviation is worth going to see. It's really cool, really well done, and it's right there on your airport. So come see it. And you know, that's the kind of thing we want to promote too. And then um, some of the business development here, we're selling the site to FedEx that's going to build, have 100 trucking bays. They're going to open 65 trucking bays within a few years, it's going to have 100 trucking bays for FedEx freight. Peterson, there's parts. So you can see the, the, the right of the slide. When you think about Peterson, you think of all that left, but Peterson leases a spot to Fort Carson that is their rapid deployment facility. So when you think about this, the mission that the Colorado Springs Airport offers, not just to locals and not just to Peterson Air Force Base itself, but nationally to our defense is also a big part as well. And this is the business park. So you can see kind of laid out what we're thinking. Um, and we have a broker that we've hired that we're working with to help do that. So again, we deal with everything from business development, planning, zoning, right-of-way development, um, and other and business leasing to all the things that just run in there. Do I see that you lease this space to Boulevard Building? Or Slide in Boulevard? Or is that? No, that's it. That's just the road. It's just a street. Okay. Yeah, it's just Bud Regger Boulevard. Like, what? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I really expect that. Brewery. No, I like that idea. <laughs> 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 that's so, <laughs> so that's it, really. So, you know, I've talked for most of an hour here about the airport and about <laughs> what it is we do here. Um, and I would really just conclude by saying that it's never it job. I think it's easy to get caught up in the day to day of what I got to do today, what I got to get done. But I want people who are watching this and all of you to think about it in a, in a big picture, and I try to help remind my staff in a big picture of what we do. In aviation, we connect people. The world has changed so much in the last century, and it's changed through aviation, and it's changed through airports connecting people. When you think that 100 years ago, there were people who never traveled more than 20 years, 20 miles possibly, of where they were born in their life, now you have people connected to all parts of the world. And we see it every day in the terminal. People that are going to see friends or welcoming friends. People are going to see family, going to events. People going for work or people going for or just to see a new and exciting place. And that's what we do in aviation. And that's why it's exciting. And that's why it's fun every single day. So I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. Mm -hmm. And we'll um, let you go. Do you guys <laughs> offer your employees company tuition assistance so that people? We do have through the the city has a program for you know additional tuition assistance. And you know, personally, I mean I encourage we have not just through, you know additional you know, formal school training, but through the organization that we're part of, the American Association of Airport Executives, there are meetings, conferences, and training, everything from how to deal with rail cars and ground transportation to design and construction, airfield safety, etc. So we have a lot of ongoing education. Do you know what about the status a year or total? I can't tell you. I can't tell you a number here. Easy enough to get that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? What percentage of your uh, employees just have aviation background? Is that like would that would you say that Great. would be That's a good question? Or? Well, so, some. So some of the like the supervisor, manager positions, some of them that come from aviation, but that said, our finance and accounting manager, who's a pretty senior position, did not come from the aviation industry. So did not have specific aviation, but had good finance and accounting you know, experience. 
um, a lot of our equipment operators, field maintenance, attendants, those positions, we train them. So they come in without, without specific training. But at that sort of supervisory level, people with an aviation management degree, they're certainly the kind of people we'll look at. And the people that are interested in civil operations officers, same thing. We'd like them to come with some understanding of the aviation environment. So it sounds like um, <clears throat> really the airport can use, it's just like any other business. You know, you have your account, you have your management, you have your IT, you know, so it seems like um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be specific for aviation, but really it's just any business. It's like any other business, but way more fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then one last question. Uh, this is just kind of a fun question, but uh, I know it says here you design and construction in Denver, <coughs> Denver International Airport. Mm -hmm. So is there a secret bunker underneath? <laughs> where, the, where the aliens are? Right. No, it's where you can get to the terminals faster than the class. <laughs> I, I can't tell you that, or I'd have to feel like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's a non-sale. Yeah. <laughs> See you guys later. All right. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.